Bishop Strickland just got a so okay, let's get a let's go back a little bit. A couple months ago, there was an apostolic visitation to Bishop Strickland. And during that time, a lot of people were kind of speculating of what the cause was. Uh, many people say it was because of this tweet that came out. And I'll read to you this tweet, but honestly, I don't think it has anything to do with this tweet. Because the tweet came out, and then the apostolic visitation came out like literally less than 48 hours later. And the Vatican doesn't move that quickly. The Vatican moves very slowly. They're very, and I wouldn't really say careful, but it's just that things move very slow in the Vatican. Whereas if it was because of that, he would have got the apostolic visitation and he would have been gone like the next day. The fact that it's taken a couple months to kind of play out shows me, tells me that this was more. There's more to it. But here is the tweet that people are saying caused this. On May 13th, he had a tweet that said, I reject his program of undermining the deposit of faith, his being Pope Francis. He says, but please allow me to clarify regarding Patrick Coffin. Has challenged the authenticity of Pope Francis. If this is accurate, I disagree. I believe Pope Francis is the Pope, but it's time for me to say that I reject his program of undermining the deposit of faith. Follow Jesus. So that's the quote from Bishop Strickland that people are saying is the cause of his of his woes right now. I don't think that's the case, but what one cannot say is that Pope Francis is a set of a conscious because I mean that Bishop Strickland is a set of a conscious because he very explicitly says that he believes Pope Francis is the Pope. So that's very clear. Now he says, follow Jesus. This is something that is good, no? So this happens, a couple months go by, and there's different people who are critiquing Strickland, saying, Bishop Strickland, you should just lay low. Just don't don't ruffle the boat anymore. Stop, stop saying things that are so controversial. And what did Bishop Strickland do instead? Well, instead, Bishop Strickland continued to teach the faith. And people were like, oh, you're coming after Pope Francis. But if you read his letters, because I've read both of his letters that came out. I've read them before. We talked about them before. And I re- reread them for getting ready for this morning. Nowhere in any, either of these letters does he mention Pope Francis. All he does here is reaffirm the teaching of the church. He says, Christ established one church, and therefore only the Catholic Church provides the fullness of Christ's truth and the authentic path to salvation for all of us. He says, the Eucharist and all the sacraments are divinely instituted, not developed by man. He says that it's a devastating sacrilege for an individual to receive the communion unworthily. He said the sacrament of matrimony is instituted by God. He has a couple other things listed here, which maybe we'll come back around to. But if you're going to tell me that him saying this makes him against Pope Francis, I think that says more about what you think about Pope Francis than it does about what Bishop Strickland has to say. I think that's very concerning. And then he comes by, and when you read what what Strickland has to say about these things, it's like a father speaking to his son. It's like you're reading the church fathers. And I'm not saying that his, his sway and his authority is on par with the church fathers. I'm just saying when I read it, it echoes the sense that I get when I read Chrysostom. I agree, listen to this, how he ends his letter here. My dear sons and daughters, be assured that angels surround us in this battle. And saints, especially our holy and blessed mother, offer their heavenly assistance as we seek the eternal prize our Lord has won for us. Remaining your humble father and servant, most reverend Joseph Strickland. Like that is such a, you don't hear that anymore. I don't feel that love of a father from anybody except from Bishop Strickland. No bishop, no priest I've ever spoken to has spoken to me in a way that I felt like, oh man, this this guy truly and really loves Almighty God first and foremost, above everything else. But when I read what Bishop Strickland says, I immediately believe that he loves Almighty God, that he has God first, everything else second, God first, and that his love for me and his letter for me is outflowing of his love of God. I have no doubt in my mind. And so this happens. And so what happens now? We find out the pillar reported yesterday 
at about one o'clock. He they reported that Bishop Strickland is going to be asked to resign. That he they a few bishops met with Pope Francis on Saturday, and they have decided that they're going to ask Pope Francis. I mean Pope, geez, to ask Bishop Strickland to resign. This is very very concerning. It says here. From the pillar, the situation of Bishop Strickland is the agenda, one senior official close to the dicastery told the pillar, and the expectation is that the Holy Father will be requesting his resignation. That will certainly be the recommendation put to him. Depending on how the bishop responds, the strength of that encouragement could be increased. That's interesting, huh? So people were automatically reporting. They were like, oh, he's just uh, asking him to resign. It's not exactly... A way that it's not exactly a thing that you refuse. It's not really a request. It's kind of like when your mom asks you to do something and you're like, oh, no, thank you. And she's like, I wasn't asking you, I was telling you. That's basically what Bishop Strickland has going for him right now. The officials cited the case of Bishop Richard Sticka, who announced his resignation as Bishop of Knoxville, Tennessee, earlier this year. After being informed, he no longer had the confidence of either the Holy See or his clergy. If you remember, Bishop Sticka was removed because of his, well, people believe because of his outspoken resistance against the COVID vaccine. Now, Bishop Strickland is in the same situation now. And Bishop Strickland is going to be pushed out. And so the question is, what happens if he refuses? People are saying, okay, what is he going to do? Should he refuse? Should he not refuse? Now, whatever he decides to do, I'm going to accept because, I mean, it's uh, going to be a very difficult, it's a difficult thing. So there's, I don't think there's a right, a wrong answer of how he can respond. But if he decides to resign, well, the point here is they're probably pressuring him very hard and saying, like, look, we're giving you a chance right now. You can resign and you can save face. Or if you decide to deny the request, then we're going to start dropping some a lot of pressure on you, and it's not going to be good. We're probably going to be there. Maybe they're saying, look, if you resign now, uh, maybe we'll let you choose your own successor. Maybe we'll choose someone from your diocese. Uh, they are probably have this kind, some kind of conversation like this where he's going to have to decide what is the correct solution. There really is none. Every, every solution is going to be very difficult. Now, the Archbishop Christopher Pierre, who is the Apostolic Nuncio to the United States, if you want to express your concerns, he's the guy that you want to send a letter to. You want to send a letter in all respect, in all charity, and say that you would like for him to be able to stand up for Bishop Strickland, to endorse him. We have to have a position of promoting the good bishops and not the bad bishops. And the reason why this is concerning is because they're claiming, they're saying, look, look, this is not about the comments about the Pope or the Synod. There's also real problems in the diocese, the Pillar Report. Those were the focus of the visitation. There are concerns in the diocese about governance and financial matters and about basic prudence. This seems to me to be absurd. Bishop Strickland has more vocations than, to my knowledge, any diocese in America I actually know personally seminarians who left their diocese to join Strickland. This is very concerning for other bishops in America. They don't like that. They see him as stealing vocations. And you're telling me that the governance and financial matters in Tyler are worse than, I don't know, Chicago? Are worse than California? Are worse than... Washington State, there he's worse because I haven't heard about anyone else getting apostolic visitations. Uh, what about all the bishops who are shutting down churches, who are closing churches because they're running out of money? Uh, what about all the dioceses that are paying out because of the sex abuse crisis, paying out money? Are they those bishops getting removed too? Mm, I don't think so. I don't think so. In fact, Bishop Stephen Chow of Hong Kong, China, last. Week he shared, uh, or not last week, a few few weeks ago, and shared his hope that the church will one day ordain women. Is he getting punished, or did he just get appointed bishop? 
Or what about Cardinal Mel- McEl- McElroy, who doubled down on heresy, pushing communion for sexually active homosexuals and adulterers? Or what about Cardinal Jean-Claude Hollerick, who is a member of the Council of Cardinals, he that says that he believes the church teaching on sodomy is false. Instead, he was actually appointed the realtor general of his synod on synodality. Or what about Victor Manuel Fernandez, the cardinal designate, who is the prefect for the dicastery of the Cong- doctrine of faith? He has a lot of concerning things. We went over a number of them. Uh, one thing of note, and not the worst thing, is his book on kissing. Very uncomfortable to read, to be honest. This is very concerning. This is very concerning that we see a pattern of good bishops getting punished and bad bishops. Nothing happened or they get promoted. How does that work out? How does that play out? How does that make sense to you? It doesn't make sense to me. I'm very, very confused about why they would do this. And we have to keep in mind that in 1534, out of 17 English bishops, only Bishop John Fisher voted no to Henry VIII's oath of supremacy. Only one of all the bishops in England, only one bishop stood up. In America, we have a couple, we have a few, and we have to rally behind them, pray for them, support them. We'll come back with more right after this. Rudy mentioned this uh, at the uh, first in the first uh, news break about Victor Manuel Fernandez uh, coming out about the the topic of um, of the heresy and schism, right? Yeah. So he uh, is. Kind of speaking out here, he says in this article, uh, this is from Catholic News Agency, he says, look, there are people on both sides, on traditional sides and progressive sides that think that they can interpret the, you know, the teaching authority of the Pope. And so then he goes on to say, you know, you cannot be so bold as to know what exactly it is that's going to be happening here. Such an idea would lead you into uh, to be a, a heretic because heretics always know uh, how to interpret things correctly. And so he's making a facetious remark here, but actually there have been some concerning things that uh, he has mentioned, or rather that maybe he possibly believes in by sort of what he's been saying, um, that we can take into account here. And he's saying also in this article, and this is an interview with uh, Edward Penton, he is saying that um, that, uh, you know, we can't be so bold as to think that we're going to change doctrine. Mm. And yet he still believes in some of these kind of really detrimental things like blessing same-sex unions. Yeah, the it's really interesting because the problem with a lot of these, this is kind of one of the reasons people ask me why I don't quote Pope Francis a lot. They're like, uh, well, why don't you quote the good things Pope Francis says? Uh, the reason why is because you can basically... With people like Victor Manuel Fernandez and people like Pope Francis, you can quote them basically saying anything. And so then it just becomes a battle of quotes. I can quote this, and then you can quote that, and they're contradicting each other. So then who do you go with? And so I just say I'm not going to play that game. Because Victor Manuel Fernandez, in the art, in the interview with, with um, Edward Penton, he's like, no, no, I completely affirm the church's teaching on, on, um, on marriage it's between one man and one woman because Edward Penton asked him about it and he says that. But we've seen him say opposite things elsewhere. And so now you're going to have people who say, no, 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 Victor Manuel Fernandez, he clearly he supports church teaching. It's right here. He said it right here. And they're going to point to that. And then three sentences down. And then th- exactly. You'd be <laughs> like, but he said over here the exact opposite of that. And so it becomes very confusing. This is why we have to just be have this hermeneutic of suspicion when it comes to these things because we don't really know. We don't really know what they're going to say, what they mean, what they truly mean by what they're saying. Now, what concerned me the most of what he said here, he says, now, if you tell me that some bishops have a special gift of the Holy Spirit to judge the doctrine of the Holy Father, we will enter into a vicious circle and that would be heresy and schism. What concerns me is the phrase, the doctrine of the Holy Father. Is the doctrine of the Holy Father different from the doctrine of the Catholic Church? Why did he say the doctrine of the Holy Father? It's not the Holy Father's doctrine. The doctrine 
is the doctrine of Jesus Christ, is a doctrine of the Catholic Church. So why use that kind of language? It's in the context of, he says, I do not have this charism, nor do you, nor does Cardinal Burke. I think it's interesting how he explicitly calls out Cardinal Burke. Today only Pope Francis has it. And he's referring here to a special gift of the Holy Spirit to judge doctrine. Hmm. That's very interesting. Because he's setting up this position which might be called a uber papalism or may some people have uh, jokingly referred to it as hyper uber papalism or hyper uber ultra montanism um just trying to just add in as much as you can which basically saying that the bishops don't have any authority anymore but the bishops do have authority they are part of the magisterium and cardinals even more so it's not the pope on his own now of course the pope is head of the church of course the pope has unique authority and no one is above the Holy Father except our Lord Jesus Christ. But the doctrine does not belong to the Holy Father. The Pope is the protector, or at least should be, the protector of the doctrine, of the treasury of the faith. And so the fact that he comes out and says the doctrine of the Holy Father, and then we see in conjunction with this what's happening to Strickland, what do we see? What did Bishop Strickland say that was so bad? All he does is profess the faith. And honestly, I don't know how anybody can consider Bishop Strickland a, a radical. His positions are very, very normal. They're just very normal. I know one thing that came out that was very, very controversial was that on the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul during the 2022, there's an apostolic letter, Deserado, uh, Desert, Des, here he goes. Desiderio Desiradovi, I totally said that right. He came out, there was a document that came out saying that people could go and receive Holy Communion in a state of sin. This is very concerning. And so Bishop Strickland, along with many other priests and bishops and deacons across the world, came out saying that that would be a heretical position if someone was to hold that you do not need to receive, you do not need to receive confession before receiving communion. He said this is a condemned position by the Council of Trent. And many people think that is what's getting him in trouble. Because it was signed by Bishop Strickland, and he was endorsing this. And that's very, very concerning for many people. But I say... Why would that be concerning? He's literally just expressing what the church has always taught. What's controversial about saying that? There should be nothing controversial about him saying that. He tells us to take up our cross. And so what is the solution here? What can we do to help Bishop Strickland? Well, the number one thing, and the thing that Bishop Strickland himself asked for explicitly, he said, please pray for me. That's the number one thing. That's the number one thing. It may be fast for him as well. Some demons can only be driven out by prayer and fasting. So maybe we can offer up some sacrifices for Bishop Strickland. That he stay faithful to Holy Mother Church. That he have the courage to stand up like a Bishop John Fisher. Because think about it. Out of 60 German bishops, only three bishops, two were auxiliary bishops, voted no on all the texts advocating for blessings of homosexuals, women clergy, contraception, acceptance of trans ideology, three out of 60. And yet, Strickland's the one getting in trouble? Mm, seems weird to me. Seems very strange to me. So let's pray for Bishop Strickland. Let's write letters to our bishop saying, hey, could you please, in respect, write letters in respect saying, please, support Bishop Strickland. We'll be right back with more right after this.